Good evening. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming very much. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get started as soon as I can. Uh, we're live streaming tonight. We're trying to connect up with a board in, in Thunder Bay. They don't have access to PD for this kind of stuff, so they asked that we could do that. And so it, it shouldn't really impact what you're doing tonight at all, but just know that it's being sent to them. It's not being recorded, it's just being sent to them. It is being recorded. recorded. It is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't no, no, want to no, no, do no, no. just do this when you walk in front of the camera. But I'll uh, edit that part out after. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what I just said. Thank you. But I don't sound too dumb. Uh, there's two types of Sphero. Well, there's more than two, but there's two types that you'll have access to. Thank you so much. Um, these are the new ones that were sent out. And I just need to explain the difference. Uh, the easiest way to denote the difference is this one has a blue stripe, this one has a white stripe, but a little bit deeper if you have a different model. These are called the Spark Plus, they're brand new. There's some advantages to them and disadvantages to them. So it's not the end of the world if those are the only type you have, but they're a little different than the traditional ones. So some of the stuff in the workshop, I was quickly scrambling to change just to make sure I'm, I'm meeting everybody's needs. So there are kind of two streams to what we're doing tonight. Some information about how to connect with Tickle and some information about how to connect with Lightning Lab. You can use both types of spheros with Lightning Lab, but you cannot use the brand new spheros with Tickle. Tickle is very primary friendly. There's a lot of different ways it can be used. Lightning Lab can be brought down pretty low, but it, it, it's just, it'll be slightly more challenging, but we'll walk you through that process tonight. If that sounds really horrible to you, um, that you've got kind of the wrong one or something, we can talk about that. If you have more junior students, it's not a disadvantage to have the older one. Thank you. Nope, that's yours. I'll take it. That's my one? No, I think. Okay, uh, charging a sphere also while I'm on topic. I don't know if this is in the slideshow, I can't remember, but I usually don't do too much with the slideshow. I just kind of get you doing stuff. Uh, if your Sphero doesn't go in the charging port properly, it won't charge. So you can see through these, which is nice, but with the older ones, I always have the kids place it on the table and it will find its heavy point. Once you put it on the table, lift it, put it on the charging port, and it will always charge. Because there's a lot of times where the kids don't put them on properly, or even teachers, and they go to get it the next day instead. So just a little from using them a lot. Okay, uh, this is Megan Lowe. Megan does a lot of stuff with Spiro and coding, and she is co-presenting tonight, or this is her first time doing a workshop, so she's co-presenting but she'll be running it soon. Okay. Um, okay, so has anyone never heard of Sphero and never seen it before? Okay, then this is kind of your slide. Sphero is a small robotic ball that gives block coding, and if you use Lightning Lab, you can even, if you're in grade eight, uh, grade seven, eight, anyone grade seven, eight here? Okay, so you can move right into, it's all based on an actual scripted language. It's based off of uh, C. So you can use that and you can actually have them move into typing in lines of code and do the whole thing. It doesn't have to remain locked. <coughs> you can switch it over in Lightning Lab. So there's a lot of advantages to that. They've just updated Lightning Lab. It's a lot better than it was last year. Like, huge changes. Um, Block coding is a visual program. It's easy for children as young as kindergarten. I've run workshops with kindergarten students and they were successfully using Tickle. The key is for them to understand what the blocks say. Once they can understand what it says, they have absolutely no fear or limitations in getting and using it. Um, so, and it says here, why should we use Roblox and coding? We can talk about that at the end if you want to come back to that, like the pedagogy or how it connects to curriculum more. We can certainly do that later. I think if we just kind of get our feet wet sooner rather than later, we'll get more done tonight. That's okay. Okay, so connecting to a Spiro, uh, what we're going to do in a second is we're going to connect. Um, with the older Spiros, which I'm going to call the 2.0s, with the 2.0 Spiro, you double tap to wake it. And then right here on the screen, to find this slideshow, if you type in on a browser, if you want to follow along with it, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, forward slash, zero roles. So, and you can do it with a lower, uh, an uppercase S. If you're in this board, you can do a lowercase S. That was the original, and then I changed it to an uppercase S so that the other people can follow along as well. So if you want the access to the slideshow later, that's the link. Okay. 
So to connect, you have to go to Bluetooth. When you double tap a Sphero, it will show you three colors. Of course, if you've used them at all, sometimes they don't light up. So blue, purple, green. So it's the first letter of each color that it will show up. If you have students using more than one in a class, once you get six or seven going, it can be really, okay, you've done this. So they really have to know what they are based on the first letters of each of the <coughs> colors. If you have a, a Spark Plus, the new Spiros, ignore everything I'm saying because that's no longer an issue and I'll show you connecting in just a second. Okay, so with 2.0s, you connect on an iPad or a phone, you can connect. Uh, on a tablet, you or on a um, Chromebook, you can connect, but only with Lightning Lab. There is no Tickle app for the Chromebooks. So you can connect. We'll just move on to how to do it with Lightning Lab, and then we'll kind of get everyone connected to the Sphero and, and try a couple of things. Just a little heads up for using the older Spiros. When you disconnect the Spiro, I suggest you go in to the Bluetooth, tap on it, and say forget this device. If you don't tap on forget this device, the Spiros are kind of a, a one, a single use device. That's how they started out, like more sold in education. Um, they moved into the education market. The newer one is a little different, but the older ones, if you don't forget the device in Bluetooth, it's very difficult to get it to pair with another iPad. It, it doesn't want to connect with the new iPad. If you forget the device on the iPad, it kind of releases that connection properly, and then the Sphero much, much easier will pair with the next iPad that you try to do. Is that for the 2.0 or the Spark? 2.0. Okay. And so like, if you go to purchase more Spheros for your school, if you decide, hey, this is pretty awesome, I see lots of good connections here, and you want to purchase more, you might end up getting 2.0s. And, and that might be advantageous, because then you could use Tickle, and you can do stuff more primary-ended, so like both scenarios could end up working. Plus the uh, the newer ones, I have a feeling that uh, over time there's going to be more like Tickle will probably work with the newer ones. Right. Tickle app. Okay. So getting the Tickle app, this slide was up last year before it's now on our board image, our system image. If you haven't updated your iPads though, uh, that's just a link to go get the Tickle app. You don't want kids looking this one up. If you search up Tickle app on the on the App Store, it's it's really not something you want to uh, find. I'll, I'll leave it at that because we're live, live streaming. So. Yeah. All right. So in Tickle, if you get this uh, update available, just X out of that. You don't need the update to work with anything that you're doing, and um, just let, leave that for now. I wouldn't recommend uh, doing that, and just leave it how it is. And then you choose new project and select Spiro as the robot you want to use. Um, first block, let me look at this in a second. So uh, at this point, if you have a Spark Plus, and how many people have a Spark Plus? Okay, so I will skip ahead and show you how to do that. that I could talk about all the blocks, but if somebody is connected, maybe we'll do this. So Lightning Lab, if you have Spark Plus, this is what you want to use. There's links here to the iOS version and the Chrome Web Store version. The Chrome Web Store version works really well on an end on a Chromebook. It's basically the Android app working on your Chromebook. It downloads, so it isn't dependent on Wi-Fi, except for the fact that the projects are saved in the cloud. The advantage of Lightning Lab is when you work on your phone or you work on anything that you log into, you can come back to it and you can access your programs that you have put in. So that's that's a new thing that's kind of nice. Um, so, Lightning Lab, let's go ahead and grab Lightning Lab. If you don't have it currently, you can download it, and that way we can connect to the Spark Pluses and we can kind of get rolling. How many people are grade one to th kindergarten to three, I should say? Kindergarten to grade three. Okay, good. That lets me know where. And how many people are upper grades beyond that? Grade seven, eight, or lower? Six. Five, six. Five, six. Okay, perfect. So, we're getting. Try to tailor to where we're all going to be playing. All right. So real quickly, um, in Lightning Lab, you can create a class in Lightning Lab. So what you can do is you can give your students sign-ons. I use their uh, their student login 
because it doesn't really have any information about them that's discernible and nobody else has that same unique identifier, um, give them a password and then they can log in. So I created a class. Once you create a, pro a program, you can actually give them a partially made program that they can work with. The only issue is I'm finding right now is I've had it for three days uh, in review and Spiro, or not Spiro, um, Lightning Labs run by another company, it doesn't really matter, but they haven't approved the programs yet, so I couldn't actually give them the students right away. I think that's gonna get sped up. This is still a very new, I think it was released in June, so it's, it's quite a new build for them. It's, everything's a little different. There's projects you can go through and find for kids, but at this point, students do need to log in on a Chromebook to be able to use the program. If you're on an iPad, they can skip the logging in and they can just work on the iPad, but to do it on a Chromebook, they do need to log in, so at that point, I would suggest, especially with young kids, maybe have have logins built for them, and then they can log in quickly with that, and then they can go to choose their own program. Uh, when they click on program, it says all programs, which are the ones that are in the kind of environment that they're building right now, that Spiro's building, and then there's my programs, which are the ones that you personally have built. When you log out on that device, those programs are living in the cloud. So if you log in on a different device another time, the students do, their programs are still available to them, so there's an advantage in that. Um, so that's kind of handy for them, but you can have them just go on an iPad and do it without logging in, and they can still access their programs. Makes sense so far, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show you a program now. So my question would be, what shape will Spiro make here? Uh, it's a bit blurry. <laughs> Little. So set color, roll, two seconds, 45 speed, zero degrees. Delay one second. Roll, two seconds, 45 degrees, 90 degree angle. That's the, that's the heading. Delay, roll, two seconds, 45 degrees, 180 degree angle. Delay, roll, two seconds, 45 degrees, 270 degree angle. Square, yeah. So <coughs> building a square, pretty basic, but um, the only thing you'll notice is in Tickle, it goes by 90 degrees. So each time you tell it to turn 90 degrees, and so that was something we saw as a dis disadvantage until Megan found, this word is it? right here. So. You can have it set color, uh, we're gonna loop four times, roll for one second, 80 speed, 90 degree angle, delay one second, reset aim. So if you use the reset aim block, then it's 90 degrees each time. So we can bring it down to that, that more primary level. Um, at this point, what I think would be good for people to do, partnering up if you don't mind just for physical space, I think we should maybe start by just having build a square and then have everyone have success with that and then we'll kind of move on from there. But if you want to grab a Spiro physically and do it, this isn't a sit for two hours workshop because it, you don't get anything out of it. So if you want to grab a Spiro of ours that's charged or use one that you brought, and let's dive in and see if we can make it do a square. Where I start with this is by telling students the first thing they do, and I'm showing with uh, Tickle here, but Tickle has two variables. The variable here, you can see, is speed and time. So how long it moves and at what speed denotes how far it travels. And here with Lightning Lab, if you're using Lightning Lab, there's three variables. So the three variables are doing different things. One of them is for heading, so that isn't necessarily have anything to do with it. Once you take heading, just meaning what direction it's gonna move, once you remove heading, it's back down to two variables, time and distance. So you really have the same situation with both apps. And the first thing I have my students do is I have the Spiro move either one meter in distance or I have them move exactly three tiles on the older floors. The, uh, if you have the tile floors in your school, you can have them move with the tiles. Um, I brought meter sticks, not meter sticks, sorry. I used to bring meter sticks but they were really clunky. And then I realized I had these in the back of a closet that a teacher like 18 years ago gave me when she was retiring, they're fantastic. So um, if you want, you can take this and figure out how to move exactly one meter in length. What I do with my students is we start with moving one meter in length. <laughs> Who's messing with me? <laughs> <laughs> the 
just kidding. Um, so we move one meter in length. Once we've done that, then I say, okay, well, can you make a shape that's four meters? And so most of them go to a square. And then it's like, okay, that's cool. Can you make another shape that's four meters? Then suddenly they're figuring out how to make a rectangle. So it's just kind of a good starting place with students. You're doing measurement, you're doing 2D shapes, and you can easily tie that into perimeter, and then you move on to area, especially if you have those tile floors. There's a lot of ways to connect it. So if you want to get a meter, uh, meter tape thing, sorry. Uh, if you want to get a meter tape, and then basically figure out a shape that's four meters in length, but I'm not going to say what that shape has to be. So if you want to be a real smarty pants, and you want to do an octagon with, uh, you know, the, please do so. Um, and just take maybe 10 minutes, see what you can come up with, just using the measuring, using the different things, just thinking about how to dip it in at your grade level and having students start with that. And then if you're running into problems while you're doing that, we can jump in and help. So please get up. We, if I could have, I would have taken the tables and chairs right out because they're really not, we don't want you sitting. Hello. So if you want to make it more primary friendly, I would, suggest, I would suggest using that each time uh, so that the heading resets to zero and you're not having to figure all the math out. Quite honestly, in grade three, I'm probably just going to teach them the different degrees and let them do that, because then they'll be ready for eight and older grades. Um, but it depends a lot on your grade, too. Um, so here I made a triangle. Uh, many of you have experimented with this. The only reason I put 240 first was because I wanted to turn in that direction first. So you can have the kid, you can have them draw or create a triangle going in a different direction simply by what degrees they put up. It doesn't take them that long to figure this stuff out once they start playing with it. It really doesn't. Um, although I have definitely not used to looking the gardens yet. So, um, how can how does a loop help? Can you make a square with a loop? So this is a loop for a triangle. So what I've done here. Uh, I've gone in and I've found headings. Oh, that was nice. Uh, and I can't show you Lightning Lab on here. My Chromebook would not connect, so unfortunately, I can't. I can't screen share Lightning Lab. But you'll find heading under. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll find the heading under sensors, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you want to go to op, not operators, comparators. You want to no, it is operators. You want to go to operators and find the plus sign. So it's an add, and you're going to drop the heading into the add. So first you put the add in. <coughs> so here in roll, when we get to the last circle, which would normally be heading, you're going to drop in an operator add. Once you've dropped that block in, then you go to sensors and you grab the heading and drop it in as well. And it adds on to whatever the heading is at the start of the program. So if the heading at the start of the program is zero, and it adds 120 each time, it's going to make a triangle. If it's the heading plus 90, it's going to make a square. So uh, just try this now to make a square if you want, or you can make a triangle as well. Uh, just give it a try so you get a, ch a chance to just see how those work. And then experiment with it and change those and see what else it comes up with. Maybe not grade two at the beginning of the year, but maybe by the end of the year, you slip into that a bit more. It's just starting to make use of more of those blocks. I'll just show you one more thing before we jump back in. Um, wow. Here's an if-then block. <laughs> Sorry. You'd be good. Here's an if-then block I've, I've dropped in. So if yes. speed is less than 5, then set color to red. So if-then statements, which really in Tickle, there wasn't a lot of ways to use those, unfortunately, before. Like, it was always something that was there, but they hadn't really expanded. It works in Lightning Lab, which is kind of neat. So I would suggest also playing with that. So here, this is a comparator. Uh, there beside the, I, I, I don't remember all the terminology for Lightning Lab, I apologize. It's the operators. Operators, thank you. These just new words for me. OK, so, oh, it's right here. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> comparators is right beside operators. They're kind of the same thing, right? It's just greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to. It all ties back into actual coding language and coding commands and things that are normal in code, right? So, but here, they're just getting a chance to try these different things. And I would definitely let students have the chance to try this if they're ready for it. Throwing this into their code allows the colors to change. 
And then that leads to, can I create a pattern? Can they create a pattern that changes as they go along? So they're moving a certain distance, and then the color changes. Then you move a slightly smaller distance, then the color changes a smaller distance. We're adding all these different attributes to the pattern, and they're doing it all in physical space. There's just a lot of ways you can tie it in. So I'm talking a lot there, I'm sorry. But just play with some of those things now, and if you're having trouble, just throw up your hand, and we'll check out what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Gather your attention again. <laughs> so, another way to do this to students, another, I, I will give you more play time, I promise. I, I genuinely try to make it as much play as possible. Like, not play, but purposeful play, right? Yeah. Um, here's another way I do things with students. So, I'll show them code and I'll say, can you debug this code? This code isn't working. I created a pattern. So, and I apologize, it's a bit fuzzy. So, uh, move <laughs> twice, set color green. Roll two seconds, 40 and zero. Play sound B, set color. I'm not very artistic. Uh, purple. Uh, roll three seconds, 40% speed, 180 degrees. Play sound chainsaw. Set color, blue. Roll four seconds, zero and zero. And play sound cry. Well, my stir is supposed to move each time and it only moves three out of the four times. So what's wrong with my code? And as we get this so we can share with students, they could run the code and they could copy it, run it, and find out why it's not working. So I'm trying to create a pattern that repeats. I do it twice. Another way to do this is, is to not loop it and then say it's a pattern and then hopefully they'll say, no, why not? Because it doesn't repeat. Okay. So my pattern repeats, but and it's supposed to move each time, but it doesn't. I don't have speed on the fourth roll, that's correct. So there's nothing happening on the fourth roll, and that's what's creating the problem. So it's supposed to go forward, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, and backwards. But it doesn't go forwards because I didn't, or sorry, it doesn't move because I didn't give it a speed. So just playing with those different variables, and then the sounds it makes, it repeats the sound. So we're repeating sound, we're repeating color, we're repeating um, moving forward or backwards. So you can see all the different attributes. So there's another way to teach patterning, because kids always have trouble with attributes and including enough attributes. If they physically code it, they will include all the attributes when they have to explain it, because they've done them all. They, it really means something, rather than position, color, like when you're just drawing on a piece of paper, it's a whole different level to patterning. And it, all in grade one, all the way through, right? Um, if I was grade seven, eight, I'd probably get those if-then statements and having getting those to tie into the pattern as well, so that you're you're creating a kind of third or tertiary level to how the pattern's working. Um, so debugging is great for the kids. Give them a program that doesn't quite work, and then let them figure out what's not working in the program. Have them replicate it, right? And and the and this works in Tickle as well. I'm I'm showing Lightning Lab, but I mean obviously you can use this in Tickle as well, and then let them figure out what's not working. Um, we're going to go back to trying things in a second, but just how does this connect to measurable student learning? Because I know if you go back to school and you would like to convince your principal why it would be a great idea to have more spheros so that you can get more of the kids using them. If you only have two, there's a lot of different ways you want to tie it in. Uh, right now, I've heard that math is a, a push on our board. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys have noticed. Um, so this is literally word for word out of the curriculum. So the mathematical processes, and, and so they're all interconnected, and right away, problem solving and communicating have strong links to all other processes. So if I go back, um, and I pulled these from something I did with Scratch, so I didn't even, I didn't even change these to, to talk about Sphero specifically. So this is just coding in general. So working through solutions and problem solving with an understanding of how various code affects their sprite. So even tonight, as you tried to do things and things didn't work, you went back, you changed a line of code, you changed the variables, you changed something, and you were able to see it, you problem solved through, you worked in a group. No one here was working by themselves that I'm aware of. Were you? Little-ish. Little-ish. I'm not so, G1, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so in class, like the whole, the whole way we model this is we have the students working in small groups, everyone has a role, we switch those roles, uh, co-pilot, pilot, problem solving together. So reasoning and proving, well, you reason through why the code might work. I don't even know what I wrote here. And then instant feedback when you actually try to run your code. Did it work? Didn't it work? So go back, check it, 
Improving at the end is they videotape it, they, they send it to you through Google Drive, they're done, they've done their project. Reflecting. Uh, each time they've successfully completed something and you have them sit down and, and write about, okay, what worked, what did I have to iterate? Uh, what did I, what really, really made the difference or what was the single most important thing I learned from doing this program? Let, to find the highlights. Selecting tools, computational strategies. Um, well, computational thinking is literally, not figurative, it's literally what we're doing here. So, I mean, that ties in really well. But again, being able to select from the different palettes or the different choices and pull things into the program, starting to become more efficient in how they do things, using a loop, all those different things allows those students to start to select the best tools and make their code more efficient, and that ties right in as well. Uh, connecting, they still connect something they did in another program. So if they did a loop with a square and they figured out heading, they're going to apply that to the triangle. They're just naturally going to start to do that. They'll take all the skills from building a triangle and a square and apply it when they start doing their patterning. It all links together and they build their repertoire of what they can do with coding. Um, representing, <coughs> it literally represents what they've done. Everything they do is instantly represented, right? It's not even on paper. And then communicating. So having them do a video interview, having them uh, do it and explain everything, explaining what they did and drawing it out, or screencasting it. Have them do a screencast. Do it on Android. Use Screencast-O-Matic. Have them record their voices while they set up their program and then explain what happened, and they can video on top of that and put it all together for you. There's just so many different ways you can share that. If it's an older grade, have them build a Google site. Have them throw both videos up, the video of how they built the code and the video of what actually happened. Um, just lots of ways to tie it back in. I would strongly suggest going and putting that pitch forward because there's so many ways it ties into math. Um, I just think that there's a lot of valid uses. Any thoughts or? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, uh, and then these are just some different activities. So this is what we talked about earlier. Uh, set the sphere to travel for five seconds at various speeds. To measure how far Spiro actually moved to each speed percentage, um, you know, just an easy place. You can tie it into data management. They can they could do this with four different Spiros, probably different results too, especially with uh, Tickle. So you can try that. Um, these are just basic things. So measurement and geometry, 2D shapes, uh, perimeter and area. So with those tiles, you can start to pull that in. You can do it by actual measurement or in younger grades, the tiles are your tool that you measure by. Um, have groups try to trade a shape that would be difficult for other groups to navigate with Sphero. So then the challenge, they have to be able to, to code to go around the shape, but try to make it as challenging as possible for the other groups to do. Measure the perimeter, and then, so there's just lots of different things happening when they do that. Uh, taking it to language, write a fictional story. Um, I don't know why that picture's there, but that's a chassis for something else we built. But have them write the tale of Sphero, so then they can record the story, you can green screen it and have a background going in the background and put it on table and have like different backgrounds changing and the Sphero can, you can code it through. Uh, my daughter did these for me. Um, get a cup, create a little character, grade two, wheelhouse, there you go. And uh, you throw those on top and you have them move in, have them dance together. Oh, it's nice to see you, it's nice to see you too. And then have them kind of dance together and, and, and there's so much you can do. Or have the characters like slowly walk off stage, other ones chasing and bumping into them. like. Talk about bullying, have that pulled in. There's just so many different ways you can tie this together. Um, procedural writing, have a screenshot of the code they've made, then have them sit down, and I would do it in Google Docs, like with the picture, but you could also just have them share the screenshot with you and then they can write out each step, what it meant, what the code means, tell them to explain it to someone who's never coded before, you're letting them tell someone else how to go about doing it. Sphero music, so if they compose music with, um, well, there's lots of ways, Soundtrap or, um, what's the one I was talking about? What's the one where the characters come up and they go, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, so, Incredibox. <laughs> Incredibox. So, here, should I, do you guys have something? Oh, it's very fun. So, Incredibox. Um, Ready to go off topic. This is this one. So you can have the kids jump into this, and create music, and then the state, they create a dancing composition for the Spiro based on oh, the music nice they've cool. created. So again, it's just playing with different possibilities. Thanks a lot, Google. Okay, Incredibox. 
We'll skip the intro. Whoa, that's not very happy. Okay, so right, it's just loading. We have speakers. Let's see, so let's work on the speakers. Okay. the beat so they're thinking about beats and you can set it with different there's different versions so you can get it going different speeds uh, you, there's a lot you can do with that um, Sphero and art, art music okay so Sphero and art here's a video link if it works of a teacher I talked into doing this at Cats Camp she said I'm art and she said I don't know how coding would tie in it so what if we gave the Sphero some paint and so she painted a bird oops we went off the line <laughs> <laughs> we cleaned it up. But, and so, I mean, other than running out of paint, it, it did a pretty decent job. So she coded, and that was with Tickle, and she coded to make a bird. Uh, Megan and Catherine Seston Jones, they kind of took it to the next level. They put it inside <laughs> one of the kindergarten uh, water tables, or, and then had it paint in there, so just there was a more controlled um, environment. But if you went outside with it, you'd be fine. Um, so just there's another option. Just lots of ways you can tie it in. Um, so. What I would say is, in the last little bit there, if you want to just kind of try to pull in a, a heading plus degrees or, you know, try to play with the operators or an if-then statement so you can get it to change color by doing something, take a, a chance right now. We'll, we'll be done at quarter six, I promise, so in about 20 minutes, but, and you can stay longer, but if you just want to take that time to try and pull in some of those, um, some of those other blocks you haven't used yet, that way if you're running into trouble, we can troubleshoot your code and see what we can do for you. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So again, this, is work, this uh, workshop has bit.ly forward slash Spiro Rolls. You can get access to everything within here. Spiro Rolls. Bit.ly is a URL shortener. Bit.ly forward slash capital S. But if you do a lowercase s, anyone in our school board can access that. I did an additional one with a capital S so that if you use another account, you can still access it. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I don't know if you actively use Twitter, but um, I'm on Twitter and I share anything I do with Sphero, any of that stuff. Also, if you if you follow each other and you DM me, direct message me, and ask because you might not want to ask me a question in front of everybody, right? Like, <laughs> like, we, like it happens to everyone. I, I I asked someone something once and I was really glad I could DM oh, them because I thought I'm going to sound really dumb if I asked this in public. And so be, having that bit of privacy, and then if you ask something, I will get back to you. Um, the only time I I wouldn't like if I'm in the middle of teaching class, but at break time and stuff, I do check my phone and I'm always happy to help. So. If you, I'm, and I'm sure Megan feels the same way. Sorry, yeah. Megan. Yeah, for and sure. uh, those are our Twitter handles right there. So, you know, feel free to reach out and, and touch base there. That's kind of the easiest way. Actually, we'd love to hear how it goes. Some people have some great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we've covered everything that we could reasonably cover at the time. Uh, if you have any questions, again, you want to stick around. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.